to another edition of Turn Out a Punk. I'm your host, Damien Abraham. Once again, I'm bringing you a conversation with someone who grew up listening to punk, may or may not still be involved with punk, but had the life changed by the genre in a major way. And today on the show, huge guest, someone I'm a massive fan of from Super Furry Animals. Griff Reese is here, and oh my gosh. This is a good one. This is a awesome one. He's got a brand new book that, as I tell him, it's it's probably going to be one of my books of the year, if not my book of the year, because it's a, a real joy to read. Resist Phony Encores. More on that in a second. But first, if you want to get in touch with me, head over to the email address, turned out a punk podcast at gmail.com. That is run by my brother, Tristan. He is the guest booker and the show producer, and I love him very much, and thank you, Tristan, for all the hard work you do, and he will get the message to me. You can also find me on Twitter and Instagram, at left for damien There is a Turned Out a Punk Facebook page, as well as an Instagram page, both of those run by Tristan, and those are found at Turned Out a Punk on their respective platforms. If you want to support the show, the best way to support the show is just by telling all your friends about it. You can also rate it. And subscribe to it on iTunes, and thank you to everyone that does that. And uh, you can also head over to patreon.com slash turnedatapunk and check out some of the stuff we do over there. And thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone that does do that. Very much appreciated. And uh, uh, speaking of support, the show would not be possible with the kind support of the fine folks at Vans who came aboard a few years ago and said, Damien, do what you do. Just don't do it out of your own pocket. And uh, I have really appreciated that. They helped me cover the cost of this thing. And it is, it's amazing. It would not be possible without them. So thank you to them for doing that. Uh, also, Fucked Up has a brand new song, the band I play in, called Year of the Horse. It's 94 minutes long. You can find it on streaming services now. It's going to be coming out later this year on vinyl, on tank crimes, and CD. And I may be a tape. Probably a tape, uh, but those will be coming out on Tank Cries, but you can hear it now on streaming things, and it's, I think, <laughs> it's a lot of tracks when you listen to it on streaming services, but check that out. Okay, on to today's show. Today on the show, Griff Reese is here from uh, Welsh legends, Super Furry Animals, but more than that, he's also like a deep, deep head punk rocker, and I hit up my friend Cam Lindsay uh a you know, long time friend, someone I worked with when I worked uh, worked with at The Wedge and someone who knows more about music than just about anyone I know. And I'm like, yeah, man, you remember when you told me about Griff from Super Furry Animals being really into punk? And he's like, no, I had no idea he was until you just brought this up. So I don't know where I heard this originally. I heard it from someone that interviewed him and talked about what a deep punk head he was. And so when the opportunity to interview him came up, uh, it, it, we, we went for it because... Griff has a completely unique perspective um, for every for and versus anyone who's been on the show so far for talking about minority language punk rock, specifically Welsh language punk rock, in um, in the punk scene and how that fit in. And this is I I learned tons from this episode. Oh my gosh, I took notes. Uh, I I you know there's so many bands I've learned from this thing. I really really love this one. Uh, I go, I'm going to apologize right now off the bat to anyone that I offend with my pronunciations. I am brutal with the English, English, <laughs> there you go with the English language, as you can hear when you listen to this podcast. So the Welsh language, I really, really struggle with, and I apologize to anyone offended by my pronunciations, but ho, oh, I, I, a lot of these bands I had never heard out loud. Like I've just read the name and I've never heard anyone say it, even going to Wales. So I was very, very grateful to Griff for, you know, educating me on all this stuff. Pick up this book, Resist Phony Encores. I make a very clunky analogy how it's like there's a monster at the end of this book, the Grover book from Sesame Street. Just in the way it reads, I suppose a much more apt, probably respectful comparison would be comparing it to some of the, uh, you know, text art, you know, that that situationist stuff. And, 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 you know, like there's a lot more sophisticated things that I'm sure I could evoke, but I love that book. I love that Grover book. And hopefully Griff has picked it up uh, to read to his little one, because that is a fun one to read. All right. And, and it is a fun one to read for an adult. So pick this book up, check out super furry animals. And yeah, like me journey into this whole incredible world of Welsh language punk rock, because you're in for a treat. All right. I'm not going to ramble on anymore. I don't think there's any notes for me to get to. 
Uh, no, that's it. Sit back, relax, and enjoy Griff Reese on Turned Out a Punk. Griff, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor. Well, it is a huge honor for me. Um, your your new book, Resist Phony, Phony Encores, I think is going to wind up being kind of my book of the year because it is legitimately one of the most fun books to read I think I've ever read in my life. Wow. I, I just like the way it's laid out, like every page, it's like I'm surprised, you know, every every ter- page turn, I'm like shocked and, and surprised at how it's going to be laid out or what's going to come up next. Like it's a, it's a legitimate page turn. And the only thing I can liken it to, and I don't mean any disrespect to the book because obviously the information contained is incredible, but is this book that I read with my kids uh, where it's uh, don't let the monster out at the end of the book and where every page it's like just building up. And, and it's almost like it's an interactive experience reading the book as much as it's an intellectual experience reading the book. Uh, I'll, I'll try and find that. That book for my kids, it sounds good. It, it's it's one of those legendary uh, kind of kids books. I'll, I'll I'll definitely send you the name of the book and the because I think I'm I think it's Don't Let the Monster Out at the End of the Book. Anyway, it's a fantastic book. Not quite as good as your book, but um, it is a, a great book in its own right. Uh, and I've got a lot to get to. And as I did just did off the air, I want to apologize in advance for my pronunciation on anything. But um, in addition to all your stuff, which I'm a huge fan of, and and all your previous band stuff. I'm just like a massive fan of this incredible history of Welsh underground and punk rock music that that comes up. And a lot of these bands, uh, you know, even in, when my band would go to Wales and we play shows, I bring these bands up and a lot of people didn't necessarily know these bands. So I'm, I'm really uh, I'm really hoping, in addition to talking about everything, that you can help me put this puzzle together in my mind a little bit. Yes. Um, but I got to start this off the way they all start off, which is, Griff, how did you get into punk? Do you remember the first time you ever came across the genre? Well, I suppose around, you know, 1976, I had a big brother who was, and, and a big sister, and they, both their heads were, were turned by, by punk um, because they would have been teenagers, you know, mm-hmm. from 76 onwards. Um, and... My brother formed a punk band called Hood Poith, which means hot puke. <laughs> um, and he, you know, he started playing electric guitar. Um, and I, I started to collect buckets so that I could play along with him as a drummer. Um, and then the drummer from his band stole my best book kits um, and used them for his sort of kind of drum kit. Um, so I, I remember those kind of, you know, formal sort of punk and that teenagers would listen to in the 70s. Um, I was just a kid, I was born in 1970. Um, but my brother and sister had the sort of classic big punk records in the house. Um, you know, the Sex Pistols and things like um, Slaughter and the Dogs and um, the Undertones, you know, kind of mm-hmm. pop pop music in a way. Um, so that was my sort of soft introduction to punk rock in the kind of musical pop sense. Um, whereas maybe my introduction to punk rock as sort of cultural activism came later on, you know? It's it's funny to kind of like, or it's, it's interesting when I when reading about kind of the way punk hits originally, where it's almost like, you know, as much as it's this musical thing, it's also just this media circus. Like, was there any sort of fear from, you know, your parents or people around you that your, like, older siblings were going punk? Like, Because I imagine it would have been kind of frightening for a kid the way they were covering it in the press. Yeah, my brother's band got, um, they got banned after they played one show in this school and they, um, 
they went to collect mannequins from sort of discarded mannequins from clothes shops in the nearest town and they had them all on stage and all these sort of naked mannequins spray painted with the colour of puke um, and lyrics kind of complaining about the teachers and um, so it, yeah there, there was outrage maybe not from my parents but from the authorities you know yeah absolutely you know we're like were your parents like supportive of music and stuff like that like it seems like you know everyone getting into this music that's definitely cool but also alienating to a lot of parents were they were they generally hip into music parents well so um they were at, at a sort of healthy distance in that um they were into music but like um but were kind of suspicious of anglo-american rock and roll um which they saw as kind of imperialist propaganda um whereas they would allow reggae records and things into the house without question um and african music you know uh but they they had um I remember my meatloaf seven inch going missing and things, you know, because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. maybe, maybe that was a sort of part of an imperialist project. Well, that, I guess that makes a lot of sense too, because like, obviously, you know, it's, it's, it's colonized. Well, yeah. And I suppose a, a lot of our music tastes, uh, other, the kind of musical tastes globally post second world war, I suppose we decided by huge sort of Anglo-American corporations mm. um, that had a kind of worldwide reach on on the young in the in the sixties and seventies. Maybe maybe less so today. Maybe it's um, um, but um, yeah. It, it, it seemed, um, I suppose that, that this uh, um, I'm, I'm losing my drift a bit here, um, but this I suppose there's reasons why we get hip to particular music and, and it's it's often due to uh, um, I'm, I'm forgetting a crucial bit of vocabulary, so I'll get I'll get back I'll get back to that point um, when I remember. <laughs> so, well, the things you bring up, like both those musics that you, you bring up specifically, like reggae and, and obviously a lot of the sort of African music of the of the 70s that was kind of going on, is like, these are musics of resistance too. And I, it, it's um, it's interesting to look where punk takes hold in places where it's it's almost like it's a rock and roll of, you know, a politicized rock and roll, obviously. And and it, so it, it almost becomes like a music of resistance in different places, like particularly South America, where it becomes popular and and obviously Ireland as well and, and, and you know, Wales. And, and it just feels like it was like a rock and roll of kids of protest. Yeah. I mean, um, I suppose that like in the seventies, it was this kind of pop circus, uh, as you say, but maybe by the 1980s, it seemed um, maybe due to the influence of bands like Crass, maybe it, it, it was more about cultural activism and um, organizing and um, it, it, it was kind of 
it was rock and roll, but it, it also went beyond the kind of surface, the kind of sheen. Mm -hmm. Well, I think even right away, like the stuff that's coming out of Wales like that. I'm, now, this is where I'm really going to expose myself in this pronunciation thing. But Lilia God Freering, Freering, like L-L-Y-G-O-D-F-F-Y. Make, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, pair, I very much apologize for that pronunciation. No, the, I mean, look at Fernick um, and the great anthem NCB. Yes. Um, about the national call, call board. Um, I mean, I believe that song was uh, written by a, a minor. Um, um, that was known to the band. Um, and yeah, I remember that single around the house. Um, and that was a really early on punk rock record that would have you know excited my teenage brother to to form a band and things. Um, um, and it, it <laughs> it's a, a real political single and a great tune and. Um, and they, they were kind of, they were, they didn't kind of spearhead the movement. Unfortunately, they, were, you know, they, they kind of burst on the scene and disappeared, and and it took a few years for, for their legacy to um, bear fruit. Mm. Um, yeah they're the, they're the second diy band you know like obviously the buzzcocks have the, the storied first diy single but then there's the desperate bicycles and then it's them like they're like the they're like the the first wave of things and yeah like you're saying it's it's a political song like everything about this single the fact that they made it themselves they like hand stamped the labels folded the sleeves like and yeah. then and, and it's political music like that is uh you know it seems like there's a political bend to the punk rock that that's coming out uh, immediately out of Wales, almost. Yeah, and I suppose the the history of the the Welsh language in the twentieth century, well, in the nineteenth and twentieth century. I mean, it, that whole community would have been politicised. Um, mm. So, you know. Even in the folk rock boom, all the lyrics were were, were political, um, and and so the, I suppose there's a, a long history of um, activism um, emerging side by side with with the music. Um, And it's the sort of basis of the, um, because Welsh language music was underground in a sense, um, and so a, a lot of the promoters of shows would have been uh, political groups. Um, I mean, certainly in the eighties, when when I was starting to do shows, um, the promoters were people like the Welsh Language Society. Um, I mean, who are, who are ongoing, who have formed in sixty two, and um, have a have had a campaign of non violent direct action um, since then. Um, that's led to a lot of advances in rights to the language. Um, but they were also uh, music promoters um, and they'd collaborate with the anti-apartheid movement, um, for example, to put on um, punk rock shows. <laughs> um, uh, classic gigs, you know. Um, so. So I mean, 
both my sort of musical and political education in a way came from um, following bands like Andrev and, um, and their record label and also called Andrev um, in the uh, in the 1980s um, doing benefits for the striking miners uh, that um, well, Llygad Fyrnig also sang about, but um, before before the big strike of of the early eighties, um, and um, gigs to raise awareness of uh, for the anti apartheid movement. Um, there were anti vivisection um, groups promoting shows. Um, and um, it, you know it was musical entertainment but it was also an, an education it follows the 80s go on like that that political punk like it's almost as punk is less and less like you're talking about like it's almost pop music at one point in the 70s where as it goes more and more underground and i guess gets more and more tied into to hardcore and just politics in general like that that political uh leaning is is so strong you brought that you brought up that band and and harama sorry once again, yeah exactly and Revan. okay they are incredible like their first lps on workers playtime too that um that label from england that uh put out like a lot of the a lot of great stuff in the mid eighties and stuff like that. But like, it feels like, like, were they kind of like the, the big band for, for your wave of people? Like, obviously your band starts shortly thereafter, but like, were they like the, I guess, like you're saying, like they were the kind of like the Kings of the scene at that point, for lack of a better term. Yeah. They were, they were a catalyst for the whole scene. Um, and they were really organized. Um, so, you know, pre-internet, uh, who's moving the bass player made all these real life collection um connect all these real life connections and uh with people like john peel and um promoters on the anarcho punk circuits all around europe and also with other minority language groups and bands and organizations all over europe um, there's so many minoritized cultures in in the kind of bigger European states. Um, uh, so they were tour the Basque country. Uh, they did also the records were coming out in the Eastern Bloc. In uh, labels in the Czech Republic were putting the records out. Um, they were touring France and Germany but also Brittany and Friesland and all these places with other minoritized languages. Um, and um, in 1985, they put out uh, punk rock, a, a Welsh language punk rock compilation uh, called Camor Tuwylluch, which means a step from the darkness. Um, and I kind of accidentally ended up on this record as a drummer in a kind of soft rock band. <laughs> um, and th I think they were short of a song and um, they knew my brother or they'd stayed at my house after a show or something and they they hadn't heard the band. They, they, offered, <laughs> they offered us some studio time and um, they made a deal with a studio called Voil, which was owned by Dave Anderson from Hawkwind and Amandol too. Oh, amazing. Um, so my first introduction to a studio was this place run by by this guy. And, it, you know, I met kind of real super weird punk rockers in their 20s and things. And, it, you know, it was a big adventure. Um, and... They, they put out a second compilation then, and then 
Um, I mean, I'd been buying the cassettes for a few years before that, um, but that was the f- first kind of vinyl DIY comp, and it, it kind of spawned the whole scene. Um, and but I mean, they can only do so much, and the, in the end, there were so many bands, and they could only promote so much shows or, you know, they wanted to be out on the road themselves. So they started a, a kind of committee. Um, and I, I didn't realize at the time it was part of a kind of an ACO syndicate, you know, they, um, instead of organizing everything themselves, they formed a kind of organizing committee that could take over where, where people would learn how to figure their own shit out. That's awesome. Um, and that was called Pop Positive. Um, so all these people with who, had, who owned studios, you know, home studios or uh, little labels or different bands um, all started to meet up once a month in uh, Bangor in North Wales. And um, uh, me and my friend, had recorded an album. We called ourselves Fuck Fi Pope, Fuck Off Everybody. Um, and cassette, so we made 50 copies, you know, by hand on a tape to tape machine and a Xerox sleeve. Um, and we kind of gave a copy to this guy who had a home studio um called Gorwell Owen um and he had a label called Av and, and he invited this to the studio and uh you know um made that made all these connections you know and all, all these people different people put records out and did their own shows and um because they were kind of it seemed very organic at the time but in a way, it was a it was an act of activism by uh, his moon of Andrem. You know, he he put it all together and figured he didn't have to do everything himself, but he could kind of get all these different people together and they'd create this cultural chaos. You know, which which did happen, and um, you know, Gorwell ended up producing. You know, Super Fairy Animals and Gorky's Aquatic Monkey and all these bands as well, and it, it became a, a a big wider scene. Well, and that's that's what I love so much about the period of music we're talking about now, because you know, and you bring it up in the book, um, you know, with the with bands like My Bloody Valentine and you know, just Creation Records as a whole, and and just sort of like all this stuff that's like sort of the people that would have been you know, the kids or, or just, just after punk happens, but kids that grew up listening to it, kind of taking that ethos and bring it into like a new sonic place. Like no one's necessarily doing like, you know, charged hair, spiky punk, 82 punk type thing. Like everyone's doing something sonically different, but there's that, like you can tell it's that ethos kind of carried over to a new, a new place. Yeah. And I suppose I was kind of, Born in 1970, so you know I was 16 in 1986. So, kind of people like the Clash and stuff were were my elders, you know. So, it was part of a rebellion against the aesthetics of punk rock, Um, if not the maybe not the the political beliefs and the um the DIY aspect um but there's a a rebellion against the aesthetics of of punk maybe and an interest in psychedelia um as an act of sort of rebellion <laughs> against punk in, in an instinctive way you know um just just to wind up all t- punk rockers, you know, who, who kind of couldn't believe that people would revert back to 
you know, some of the hallmarks of flower power or something. Yeah, but it's funny because like, you know, because it wasn't like that necessarily even in the first wave because you like you brought up Hawkwind and, you know, and, and Pink Fairies and all these sorts of bands that, you know, are almost like the direct precursors to punk rock. Like, I think I think the uh, it's when it gets codified and all these people start thinking that punk has to be this certain thing. And then it's almost like your wave of people of bands and, and are going, no, 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 it can be it can be anything again. Like it almost is like bringing it back to the true ethos of when punk first first happens. Yeah, I mean, and it was an interesting time, and but the music I was putting out with Faculty Power, we were completely in a separate universe from um, the kind of in English language scene. Um, the word I was looking for earlier was uh, geopolitics. Um, you know that, like. When I was talking about the maybe the records, we were kind of exposed to in a big way from the sixties to the eighties. We were kind of due to the chance of geopolitics, um, and then you've got this underground that's sort of removed from it, um, and we were on this scene where we, we, we could play in Wales. Um, some punk rock um, promoters would put us on in English cities. We'd play random shows in Nottingham or London, maybe with Andrew. And then um, I remember Andrew taking us to um, uh, Brittany and France and Friesland and we'd, we'd play in uh, Anaco punk squats in Holland um, and we'd sleep, you know, we'd stay in people's houses um, and, you know, it, it could be completely immersed in whatever scene you're in, in whatever city you're in, you'd be meeting organizers and um activists and because you'd be staying in the houses and um it was such a, a, a rich experience um and you, you weren't kind of cocooned away from w whatever you're traveling to um so i just remember like and you know, pre phones and all this stuff. So I'd be in the back of a van sitting on an amp or something on an eight hour drive through France and um, some, you know, Rhys Moin from Andrew would do a kind of a political speech, that, you know, for three hours or something. <laughs> um, and um, it, it was like, going to college in a way, you yeah. know? Yeah. It, so. it's, <laughs> I was going to say, it's it's so, uh, like, what you're bringing up, like, that culture, you know, it's amazing how that still survives. Like, the European squat punks, you know, obviously everything's changed now, but, I mean, until this, like, there was still, like, some of those squats were still going into the early 2000s. Like, some of the same squats and the sort of, like, it's almost like there's, like, a direct lineage in that DIY punk scene. And there's something that's so like you're saying pure about that punk scene because it's almost like completely cut off. Like no one nest, there's like a core that of bands and, and people there that are never going to try and make it in terms of like success in the music industry. So there, that thing is going to be pure the whole way through almost as this like, you know, like, like, I don't know, like these like weird little punk communes that, that remain intact and get passed from one generation to the next. Yeah. And they wouldn't be faced by the Welsh language. They'd be, yeah, fuck yeah. Yeah. You know, let's go and see a Welsh language band. Uh, um, uh, the, I suppose they were putting out really diverse, um, putting on really diverse shows. Um, you know, that 
they weren't part of the identicate yeah. and Catholic, I suppose it, it was m much more deeply enshrined politically. When you, uh, you know, Anne Rand, when they were going out there, like, they, so they toured kind of extensively throughout Europe. So when you, did you guys tour, like, how many times did you guys go out with them to Europe, would you say? Um, David, the drummer in Super Fair Animals, um, he was a drummer in Andrem for many years. So he, I'd sometimes um, end up in the van, you know. Or just like roadie. Yeah, so I was just carrying stuff and, yeah. you know, Dad would say, oh, you know, doing a come on a tour and carry stuff. And, and I'd be, oh, yeah, great. And then maybe sometimes he wouldn't tell the rest of the band, whatever. So, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd be there anyway. And then, um, so I did a few tours, carrying stuff. And then the, the sort of first Super Fairy Animal shows were, opening up for Anne Revan, who are kind of starting to rebel against the punk aesthetic. So they asked us to put on a, an electronic set to open up for them, um, playing in these punk venues. So we do sort of improvised 30 minute electronic jams um, in in Brittany and um, the, the Breton language is a sort of sister language to Welsh. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's the reason behind the, the connections there. Um, and we'd, we'd play folk festivals and things as well, do, doing this weird electronic music, but it, it was, uh, you know, <laughs> how did that how did that go over at those punk shows? Um, I think people are open minded, um, and it was, you know, we had the endorsement of a of a punk band, so yeah, it was okay, you know, and people <laughs> yeah. were nice and, um. And we didn't think about it even. We just, <laughs> <laughs> just did it. I love I love that Anram uh, Last Rough Cause split the uh, soft lights and loud guitars part two. Uh, I think that I think that twelve inch is amazing. Like I think that band's super super underrated. Like I that's the thing is like all these bands that we're talking about here are just uh, you know and I think it's probably like you brought up like it's almost like you know people you know especially in in. Uh, in England and, and things like that and ignore minority language uh, recordings and things like that, because these are some of the best punk records that came out. Yeah. And, and I suppose parallel to this were things like MTV, you know, which is like a different universe mm -hmm. um, that was running concurrently. Yeah. Uh, um, and um, yeah, so, so it was, it was Completely underground, um, but they they did the tour exten extensively and had a big impact. Um, and um, we were almost like a joke, you know, like almost like a stunt, you know. Let's well, let's do a band and. You know, let's do a pop band and get on MTV, mm -hmm. you know, and see if we can get this stuff playing all over Europe. Um, and that kind of happened. You did it. <laughs> to an extent, you know, it, it was like a joke, you know, it was like... Yeah. Uh, um, and in terms of our interviews and things we were we'd just been given a few years of kind of intense lecturing on geopolitics 
and archaeology by by these punk bands and we we were just spouting it all back you know yeah well that's why when i like because obviously i was a fan of you guys not knowing about any of this you know history that you had in through all these other bands and and through punk music and all this stuff and it was just there's something so subversive about your pop stardom you know like watching it happen like uh as it was kind of happening as a fan it was just like every time it was something kind of interesting and you know and then eventually finding out it's like oh of course it comes from some sort of punk rock background like it it, it like it just it seems like that's like the anyone who winds up doing anything interesting in pop music has to connect connect back to this some way yeah and there's you know and, and the the layers are unbelievable like we ended up touring with um times new viking around america and they were playing as Welsh punk we'd never heard, you know, like um, the the scene from the Cumbran Polytechnic of the early 80s or whatever, you know, like uh, um, there was that Metsetics oh, yeah. 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 uh, with all these super obscure DIY bands from Southeast Wales. Um, and that were kind of related to, or kind of inspired by Young Marble Giants, maybe. Um, and it, it, it's infinite, the sort of layers um, are, you know, like, oh, there was an article recently about some anarcho-punk band that Bjork, was in, you know, her first visit to Wales was in a weird punk band years before the Sugar Cubes. Was it like Cool or Cool or something? I, I, to <laughs> I can't remember the name, but they yeah. played like in this Welsh village, you know, years <laughs> before she was known in a pop sense, like. Yeah, well, it's, it's funny when you start dissecting, like, you know, uh, people that made it, you know that were in the charts in the 90s and like you know tom york played in headless chicken and uh you know like there's all these bands that have these connections these like punk bands beforehand like it's 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 amazing how like i was trying to get to the point awkwardly earlier where it's like this is almost like the time where all of this punk stuff comes to fruition and you've got all these people that wind up you know kind of taking over the pop charts that you know came from this sort of diy punk background in some way not as deep as you are. Like, I, like they weren't necessarily going to European squat tours. Like, that's that is some deep head punk shit. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's inevitable. You know, um, you know, yeah. I suppose by the time I signed the record deal. Uh, with creation, as I'd been doing shows for twelve years, you know, mm -hmm. so it was, it was like a kind of joke to me that people would have taken interest in my music, you know. Did you guys self-release that Emily Flexi? Well, I, I was in uh, technical college with a guitarist in Emily. And I, I played one show with them, I think. Um, but it, I wasn't on any rec Emily records. Okay. <laughs> I thought but someone I, told me you played that first Flexi. Yeah. The, there was, um, I, I was in a band called Faculty Pope. I, um, but then, yeah, that Emily needed a drummer. And I, I, um, I played. I think it was just one show in the end. I, I rehearsed a bunch with them. And um, and the guitarist was really cool and introduced me to a lot of music. And um, and at the, the show we did was um, opening for Biff Bang Pow in in London, um, which was um, 
um, Alan McGee's band. Um, in it was in nineteen eighty eight. It was um, the band who had Alan McGee and Dick Green from Christian Records. Um, and it was the day before a big gig called Doing It for the Kids, which was a kind of um, celebration of creation records going overground, I suppose. So they, they had um, all their bands playing like Felt and Primal Scream. And um, it was like an all day um, at the Forum in London to, to about 2,000 people. Um, so I got to hang out there as an 18 year old and that was pretty amazing as a as a kind of fan you know yeah absolutely well that, that's like a legendary show like that's one of those shows that you know still gets talked about but i, I tried to give alan mcgee a fuck of a cassette and um he was wearing sunglasses indoors you know and it was like uh There was some kind of protocol. It, he was going, oh, you, it's not cool to give me demos when I'm watching a show or something. So I, I had to wait till I saw him in a non-public place where he wasn't wearing sunglasses. <laughs> I, think, I, I don't know. But I got like, him a <laughs> it. <laughs> it's like Superman and Clark Kent. You know, you can't approach Clark Kent about Superman stuff when he's got those glasses on. Yeah. <laughs> so sad. Um, going back to that very first compilation um, that kicked off this, uh, you know, the, the, the movement, um, it's one of the coolest covers ever with the Grim Reaper with the sickle on it. Yeah. yeah. Was, was that something that would have gotten any sort of radio airplay at all? Um, it got airplay by John Peel, I think. Uh, his moon took it down to London and um, it had a big impact. I mean, there's Welsh language media as well. Um, mm -hmm. They were kind of pop shows on BBC Radio Cymru. Um, and they, were, they got slightly ignored by by the kind of Welsh language media. So they, they had to kind of create their own in a way and go underground and, you know, fanzines emerged um, and they put on their own underground festivals. Um, but um, I suppose the breakout band from that comp was Dat Blicky. Um, and who are still putting out records and, um, uh, David R. Edwards from uh, that book is an amazing lyricist and you know if there is a sort of critical spokesperson for you know f for that era it would be Dave um and, um, you know, because he's outrageous and he's not scared of upsetting people and he's always 100% honest. Mm. Um, and, you know, it, it, the, the track on that completion was um, called The Team Lad. Um, and then we, we covered that track uh, in Super Fairy Animals, we um, we put out a Welsh language record called Mung, um, which we self released in two thousand, um, and then um, we we kind of covered that track um, on that album that got in the into the charts and stuff. So it it's nice to retell stories, um, good stories n need to be retold every every few years. Absolutely. That band is incredible. That first single is is awesome. And I think that's probably where I first heard them was your cover, 
you know, obviously not an original copy, but like, you know, in the, in the heady days of like hearing stuff on the internet. Um, and it's just, yeah, like the way you guys kind of reach back and, and, and bring that stuff forward. Like, I just think there's, you know, it's, it's a, an amazing. And, and, you know, you brought up the Basque country earlier. It's like, there's just all these places all over Europe where there are minority languages, where there was putting out these sort of classic, amazing punk records that kind of stand up to today. Yeah, it's, it's um, I remember going, yeah, to, I think we opened up for Dublicki in, in like a pub in London, maybe, maybe it's the George Ropey, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Um, I think it was in Stoke Newing, Stoke Newington, mm-hmm. and because of the Andrem connection, it seemed the entire Basque population of Linton turned up yeah. to the show as well. So there was Welsh people and Basque people and a few punk rock journalists or something. Um, and then I think Dave got thrown out after the first song because he, maybe during the first song, he launched into a diatribe against the sound guy because um, he had feedback coming out of his monitor. I mean, so the the um, the bouncers dragged him off stage and threw him out into the street. Um, you know, there, there was some mu- some hot shots music journalist turning up to review them, and he got guy, kind of thrown into his face, and that that was the end of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, what were some of your favorite bands? Uh, you know that you saw from out like on these tours or internationally um, early on. Um, I'm trying to think who we were, who we were coming across. Um, I mean, it was so random, you know. Like, like we tour with a, I remember touring with a French ska band called La Have Nots from Bordeaux, and like, but they like taught me how to do make salad dressing and things, you know? Yeah, yeah. Staying in, you know, an apartment where one of them lived and he showed me how to dress lettuce and things, you know, sort of just (laughs) random things that you carry with you. Well, good skills. Like, I'm sure you still use that skill to this day. Yeah, totally. Because, you know, um, and then... Um, there was um, there was a Breton band called Eve, and we stayed in you know one of their friends' houses or something. And I mean, before going on a tour like that, I I'd never eaten breakfast really. I'd have a cup of tea or something, and then. On these tours, you know, I'd wake up and they had croissants and these breads and things, you know, things that I hadn't come across before. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. wow, what's going on? Do you know what I mean? And um, we stayed in, you know, you'd stay in someone's house and they were like the fourth best frisbee thrower in Europe or something, you know, like. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, you know, I follow him. I still follow him on Twitter or whatever. Um, and then I remember playing in Utrecht and staying in a in a squat. And um, a folk band from Scotland uh, called Nia Fertis were staying there at the same time from Kilmarnock 
um, who had an amazing song called Red Cola, about um, a type of cola from Scotland that's red. Um, that went like, red cola, red cola, red cola, days you get red, days you get red. Red cola, red cola, red cola. Um, awesome. What what were they called again? That band? Nia Firtis. Oh my gosh! I got to find this thing. That sounds incredible. That song. I think maybe maybe it's a Scots name. Yeah, I don't know. Um, and ah, oh, that'd be. Yeah, who, I suppose, yeah, Neko Goriak was the big Basque band um, that would come over to Wales. Oh, that band's so sick. I like, I love um, Escarputo. Like, there's just so much stuff that was coming out of, um, like, Basque language punk that, you know, once again, is just like, like a real music of resistance and like, just like such an angry, you know, a, a amazing take on it. Yeah, and the you know it's a it's a it's a parallel universe. It's it's a it's a key into a different culture. Mm -hmm. It's funny because like we I I toured there. Got it. Been like fifteen years ago now, but just the level of like you know you brought up earlier waking up to breakfast. Like that's something obviously as you know from touring. In, in north america like no one does that no one cooks you breakfast you're like maybe the people if you're staying at someone's house but it's just such a like the uh hospitality of those tours for for bands is just amazing like that's why i think bands from north america started just not going anywhere but europe there was like a period in the 90s where bands just toured europe only yeah because you get fat <laughs> it's, a, it's a good deal it's a great deal it definitely it's a uh it, it it makes for a it makes for an easier tour to know at least you're going to have one good meal every day. Yeah, the I love those sort of French cooperative venues where all the staff and the bands eat together. Yeah, before shows, um, so you, the administrators and the lighting people and everyone kind of together for a period of time hanging out and um, it's really healthy yeah it does it makes it more it makes it you know like kind of brings it back to what you, you're talking about this idea of like community and like this idea that you're part of something that's not just this like monetary transaction of providing entertainment for dollars yeah and it's um it is something that gets lost um, easily, and uh, it's um, yeah, it's very, very rewarding. Yeah, that's it's something that now being at home, like I really miss. <laughs> like I would really. Like I, I never thought I'd say it, but I would love to do another European squat tour because it just is a, uh, like you're saying it's like earlier, it's like an immersive experience. It's not like going somewhere as a tourist because you're actually like embedded with people there and like, you know, actually experiencing life in a different way than you do just visiting somewhere. And certainly different than when you visit and you go from the venue to the hotel touring. Yeah, no, it's really interesting just staying in a, multi-story um, council flat in Porto or, you know, to, just seeing in yeah, just wild experiences really. Um, and, uh, you know, um I've lost my I've lost my drift a bit. Um 
I, no, no problem. I, I remember going, yeah, like I remember staying in Wales for the first time at Welly, who does art core fanzines house. And, you know, here's a guy who I've read his fanzine for years. And then uh, we're playing in Cardiff for the first time and I'm staying at this guy's house. You know, it's just, uh, it, it's like this weird kind of community thing. And that's the, that's the thing about punk rock more than a sound, more than anything that, that keeps it special and keeps it amazing is the fact that there is this sort of, uh, this sort of constant community. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. And that it was, um, it's weird that, yeah, I think the, the last time I saw you play was in uh, Austin, Texas. I think it was an open air, South by Southwest time show. Really? You saw us play? It was, um, and I was watching your show and then, I mean, it was amazing that the audience were bonding, you know, and it was, yeah. it was getting so into it. That was a real community, but the, but the best thing was the one minute the guitarist was on stage and then he wasn't on stage. He was in in the crowd and then next thing he was standing next to me watching the show. <laughs> and then we ended up back on stage. I, I don't know. It was it was a great show. It was. Well, I appreciate that. That's amazing. That I, if I had known that, I would love to have met you in person then too. But I, I think the thing is, well, like you're saying, like you, when you, you know, and obviously we never got to the pop <laughs> charts in any sort of way and, and never got really, really mainstream, but like you guys did, like you want to bring what, what schooled you, like where you're from to the next place you're at. And for us, like, you know, we're playing these giant, you know, open air outdoor festivals, like we're places we should never by right be playing. And you just kind of want to make it feel as much like that squat show as you can. Like you want to be doing, yeah. you want to bring some of what you came from to where you are. Yeah, it, it definitely worked. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, I mean, I suppose that that's what was inspiring to me about, um, I remember being a teenager and going to the Reading Festival and um, the Pitzel Surfers played. And, um, but they were, you know, they weren't playing the language of Stadium Rock. Yeah. You know, they were still true to their, <laughs> their own language. They smashed up all their equipment after the first song. <laughs> have you ever seen that video online of them playing i think it's like it, it may, maybe it's Lollapalooza, but i don't maybe it's like a like a one-off type thing in america and gibby halfway through the set just pulls out a shotgun and just starts playing it as a percussive instrument firing off shells in the air above the crowd's heads it's like one of the most terrifying things i've ever seen oh uh, yeah uh I'm going to look that up. <laughs> and everyone, the thing that's wild, and, and maybe it's just because the audience is conditioned to be okay with this kind of thing, is everyone's, no one's blat, batting an eye. Like, no one's like, they're just like watching them do it. And it, it's very, uh, very surreal to watch. But yeah, they're definitely a band that got to the same sort of thing like, like you guys do. And like, and that's the thing I loved about reading your book is like going back and kind of like, like reading about all these different things you did at different points throughout, you know, super furry animals kind of exploding and kind of realizing like how much of that traces back to, to like a punk place. Yeah. And that I suppose it's, um, yeah, it's bewildering sometimes kind of, um, being part of the, uh, the kind of condescending language of, you know, 
festival performances are the kind of authority, authoritarian community, you know, the, the people have kind of authoritarian communication skills with large audiences. Um, that, that pop music is sometimes uh, really scary and authoritarian and kind of people commanding the audience to please them, you know, and um, I kind of, as maybe schooled in confrontation and um, empathy and bands who are condescending to the audience, um, who are just, you know, part of the community or trying to make really personal music and um, building up the courage to play it. Um, and it, it can be really disorientating if suddenly you're put in front of a, a large festival audience and then suddenly you're expected to become someone wa waving flags and kind of pleasing the audience and it's, it's a kind of real dissonance. Yeah, like it's almost like the festival is like the complete inverse of these types of shows that we're talking about, you know, early on, where like this is like where it's intensely personal and you're staying with someone who's at the show that night and you know the promoter and you're eating with the promoter a lot of times, or the promoter's cooking you food a lot of times to this completely impersonal thing where you, you a lot of times, well, and certainly in my case, you never meet the booker, you know, you never even meet the, uh, you know, you meet the people that are obviously helping out on stage, but they're not familiar with your band. And, and you, you a lot of times aren't even supposed to meet the audience. Like, you know, you, I'm sure you have dealt with this too, where you play a festival and they won't even let you walk around the festival grounds. They get weirded out when you, you're like, oh, I just want to kind of see what's going on out there. And they're like, <laughs> no, 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 stay back here, stay back here. It's, yeah, I mean, things get commodified and it's, um, it, it's weird to watch sometimes and definitely weird to experience it um, or become part of it. Um, so I suppose this certain parts of the book that maybe deal with the weirdness of um, those kind of situations that feel like out of body experiences because they don't seem like rational experiences anybody should be going through. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel as time goes on, I realize like how much of this just really alters the way your brain works, you know? And it's like, it, it, it just, and it happens even on the most minor level. And it's just because these are unnatural situations. Like we're not meant to know more than a few people in our lifetimes, let alone suddenly be thrust into a situation where you have to address thousands of people um, with, with music, you know? Like it just feels like you're saying, these are just really unnatural things to be put into. Yeah, I mean, there's a bit where I talk about, you know, something going wrong, you know, playing to 50,000 people or whatever. And there's some, you know, major logistical mishap in the audience. And, you know, you think people are going to get killed or whatever. Mm. And, and if you, and, and you're the person with the microphone, you know, and you're expected to be able to lead 50,000 people to safety. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah. <laughs> when you know when you your reason for getting into this stuff was to um make experimental music in a Stevens Union bar <laughs> and every everybody's looking at you like you have some kind of answer to the situation um so there's Although um, I think my favourite festival speech was uh, Brendan O'Hare, the former drummer in Teenage Fan Club. I think he had a microphone. I saw them play at Glastonbury and, you know, he was just casually asking the audience if they mind, minded if he smoked. <laughs> you know, like 30,000 people. Yeah. Really mundane stuff, you know, I, that was really cool. Yeah, there's there's something where you can tell the bands that are cool when they kind of have to, when the bands are too slick up there, that's when you start getting a little sketched out. You're like, ah, this seems, they seem a little too comfortable with these situ situations. They seem a little too authoritarian to to be doing this. Yeah, it, it seem, seems, it should always be a frightening experience being in front of a, I mean, that's what I enjoyed about your gig, because like, you know, pe people are going <laughs> insane to it, you know, it, it, it reflected the insanity of the situation really well, rather than, you know, because it's a pretty intense experience and um, it, sh it shouldn't be a mundane experience. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, this has not been a mundane experience. And Griff, anytime you want to come back on this podcast, please know the door is always open. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, before I let you go, can I ask you one more question? Yeah, of course. When, be, like, when it's kind of all happening and, you know, you're, you're talking about, you're playing headlining festivals, and, like all of a sudden you've gone from, you know, making experimental music to, to being this pop star. Was there, were there moments of, of like, kind of like a, like almost like a, a guilt in that situation or was being famous part of the plan like you talked about um earlier um not not fame as such um because you know we haven't experienced i think truly intensive fame and we haven't um it's not something we've tried to uh encourage you know we mm -hmm. it, it's not of interest for us to be in uh to be famous you know but but we were into creating as much cultural chaos as we could and um it, it was always a, a joke to us in a way so um so there wasn't guilt to such, you know, that because it was all in the moment and we couldn't believe we were getting away with it, you know, like, yeah. um, we, we always took it for granted. We'd get dropped by large labels after the next record, you know, so, so we demand outrageous things or buy tanks or, um, you know that and there were weird things like um getting offered you know um uh adverts and um they were think you know there were a lot of things that were beyond the pale for us still you know like we we put out music through major labels and things but we couldn't go the full we we couldn't jump in fully because we couldn't you know we we, we had no interest in endorsing coca cola or mm. whatever was being pushed at us at various times so so that created there, there was a lot of ethical um dilemmas but no no guilt i would say because it was still a a trip and uh a kind of adventure 
in in chaos, you know, um, and um, but yeah, for sure, a sort of ethical minefield. Well, this has been a trip and a half. Thank you so much, Griff, for coming on the show. <laughs> no, it's a, uh, I'm, no, I, I'm I'm speechless and and. Uh, Thanks so much for having me and uh, making it so easy for me. And thank you very much. Thank you, Griff, for coming on the show and check out his book, Resist Phony Encores on Antennae Books. It is a fantastic read. And yeah, I really, I really love this thing. It's definitely going to be one of my books of the year. Uh, I can promise you that and Griff will be back for part two. And hopefully by then my pronunciation will be a little bit better because it can't be worse. It really could not be worse than it was today. So thank you Griff for, for, uh, for tolerating that and understanding that. All right. Uh, speaking of great books, the next guest on the show is actually going to be releasing a book a little bit later on this year, but we are keeping it in Europe and we are keeping it with music legends because the next guest coming up in a few short days from echo in the Bunnyman, will Sargent is on the show. That's right. And this is a fantastic, fantastic episode. Talk a lot about. Oh, just I learned a lot about Liverpool. I learned a lot about. Oh, this is. A, I'm not going to spoil it for you. Why would I spoil it for you? You're going to hear it. You're going to hear it in a few short days. Anyway, that is coming up. And uh, yeah. All right. That is it for the show this week. Remember, as always, Black Lives Matter. The lives of Indigenous people matter. We need to protect trans kids and we need to help trans people protect themselves. Stop hate and violence towards Asian people. And just there's so much. <laughs> There's literally no end to stuff that we need to do, but it basically just boils down to smashing fascism and standing up to, to hate to people that hate and to people that discriminate because these aren't political issues. These are, these are human rights issues. You know, these are very important things that, um, yeah, we just need to be informed. You need to get informed. Uh, I need to get informed, you know, when we just, you know, there's lots of places to, Read up on what's going on in this world. Volunteer your time. Donate money if you can to organizations you believe in that are doing work that you believe in. But yeah, all right, that's that's all I'm saying. Just just you know, just check it out. Check out what's going on in this world. You'll see. You'll see. I promise you. Uh, also, sign your organ owner cards because by the time they come looking for those organs, you don't need them. Just give them to someone else. Let them have them. It'll be better for them, and you'll be happy too. Uh, because, well, you'll be dead. I don't think you'll be feeling much of anything, but they'll, 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 people around you will be happy that you were able to help someone else out. So, you know, sign those cards, uh, do something creative for yourself, make your own culture, stick, create a zine, start a podcast, do, do whatever you want, you know, just to express yourself because it helps. It helps with that mental health stuff. And speaking of helping with that mental health stuff, try meditating. I find it helps with mine. Maybe it'll help with yours. And I didn't believe in any of that bullshit. And now I believe it's incredible. So give it a try. Who knows? Who knows? And that's it. All right. Stay safe, everyone. I love you. And I will see you next episode. Listen to Oil and Flowers with Buddha Blaze and I as we talk about cannabis. And that's it. Bye. <laughs>